couple of weeks ago, he preached on the topic of don't worry. Don't worry. We're all guilty, aren't we? We find ourselves stressed out over whatever. Uh, change has come and we begin to wonder what it's going to be and what it's going to be involved and begin to conjecture. But we're not to worry. And so part two of our message will be dealing with good reasons why we should not allow ourselves to worry. Number one, first reason not to worry. It's useless. It's useless. It doesn't really help. The uselessness of this worry, this anxious care, is described by our Lord in Matthew 6, 27. And he asks a question. The question is this, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? The intensity of worry, of being anxious about this, it's not going to change your height or anything else. In Psalms 127, we read, It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Sleepless nights, worrying, anxious, what about, what if? You realize that probably far the largest percent of everything that we might be worried about never happens. It's just we let our mind wander on those things. Some people are anxious to get more, to have more, to keep more of what they have. Someone might well ask, well, doesn't the Lord bless diligence? Yes, he does. Indeed, he does. But dear ones, there is a world of difference between lawful diligence and worry and being anxious. There's another good reason why we shouldn't worry. And it is this. Not only is it useless, it is needless. There is no need to be overly anxious about things or worried about them. Our Lord says, do not be anxious then, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all of these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. What more could we ask? What more could we possibly have than to know that God our Father knows what we need, when we need it. And he's able to supply that. I can think back across my life many, many times when in a very timely way, God met a special need, unique in the way the need was met. It was very evident that it came from the Lord. We 
when we began the migrant ministry in North Carolina. Our purpose was to go to a particular camp of migrants and invite men to come and hear the word of God every Monday. I was working as an associate pastor of a church there in Rocky Mount and one of the members worked for the landowner of all of this huge acreage of farming. His job was to go around and check the buildings at all the camps. And he particularly opened up this one building. It was an old tin rustic building. And inside were pews and a pulpit. He said, wow. So he goes to the owner. He says, what about that building? So and so and so has a pews in it and, and, and a pulpit. And the owner says, yeah. The man says, could we use that for a Bible study? He said, sure, the keys are hanging out of it. We hadn't even begun looking for a place to meet. And the Lord said, here's your place. That's how our Lord can do when it comes to the things that we need. He anticipated that and graciously provided a very rustic but very adequate place for us to invite the men to come every Monday night and hear the word of God. When an earthly parent knows that his child has a certain need, that parent is planning ahead and anticipating the time and how and when and where that need will be met. God is our Heavenly Father. He knows what we need. He knows when we need it. And He has the power to supply our every need. All that you may be tempted to be worried about is already being looked after by one who is infinitely better to look after our needs than we are. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. And then we have a verse in 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your anxiety upon him. Because he cares for you. The reality of that, dear people, ought to grip our hearts in such a way that we see no need to worry. Let's think of some other issues that will help us. Think of the great things God has done for you. For you. I've already mentioned what he did for us at the Margaret camp. That's one of many incidents of how the Lord provided just what we needed. Think of what he has done for us. And you know what goes really on top of the list? He is the one who gave 
us our life. He created us. He brought us into existence. He formed us in the womb. Take time to go to Psalm 139 and look at the intricacy of the creative activity of God in the womb, bringing you into existence. And you think he doesn't care about you and that he will not meet your needs? And will continue to do so. Our anxious care seems to be needless when we consider not only what he has done for us, but what he has done for others. Many, many testimonies are available of God's care and deliverance and provisions in so many wonderful and unique ways. Here's an interesting thought. Think of what God has done for other creatures. other than his children. You say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. And yet, and yet, your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Note carefully, your heavenly Father feeds them. Do you see the interest and care and concern that our God, our Father, has over these creatures? Michael and I came to church together today. We do every Sunday. By the way, let me just say, you know, I always have a good time of fellowship on Sunday. He comes over and we have a good time, and then we have the time coming to church. We like that. But as we got off of the freeway, came down to a traffic light, I don't think Michael saw them, there were a bunch of little birds picking up some kind of seed that had spilled, and they were busy, 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 picking up those seeds. Just think of that. Who fed them? God. God. Your Heavenly Father. But then the question is asked, if we can take this a dimension further, are you not worth much more than they? Sure we are. Of course. And the reasonable conclusion is that God will certainly meet our needs. There's a third reason why we should not worry. It's atheistic. It's atheistic. In other words, it is to act as if there is no God. It is to deny his essential attributes. It is a practical denial of God's, first of all, his omniscience. It's a saying God doesn't really know what's going on. Because if he did, this, 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 this. It's a denial of another attribute. It's a denial of his omnipotence, of the power to do it. 
I so often think of this when I read uh, God's omnipotence. He hung the world on nothing. Think about that for a while. That's the power he has. And then what about his sovereignty? Ruling and overruling. Are you beginning to see why we shouldn't worry? But be at peace, be confident in our God. I may have, I think, perhaps on occasion, told about one time when I got stranded. I was a young pastor out in West Dallas. And we have some folks that are part of our church in those days. And uh, for the new ones, I'll repeat my illustration because it fits right here exactly. I, it became my duty to drive an old bus, very old bus, all capital letters, very old bus, and take some young boys in the scouting program, I think, but somehow we had made arrangements for them to go to a Christian camp for a week. And it became my duty to load them up in that bus and drive them to the camp. There was a problem. The bus didn't have any seats. So we put blankets and pillows and so I have all these kids in the back. Chugging down the road to Nacogdoches, Texas. And the gear shift made a big noise and the bus wouldn't move. I found out that I could inch it forward in low gear. I'm on the hill, no cell phone, no houses, no stores, no Walmart, just us on a hill. So I kept chugging up the hill in low gear. I thought, might as well see what's on the other side of the hill. Just as we crested the hill, there was a junkyard. And I managed to chug in there and talk to the owner. He said, oh yeah, it's the fork down in the gearbox that it broke. And he said, uh, no problem, I can fix it. He says, you don't have any seats in this bus. I said, right. And I told him about the boys and where we were going. He says, you bring this bus back once you get your kids there and get them back home. And he says, I'll give you enough seats to go in this bus. So when we got back home, I, I went back and he literally gave us enough seats to put in our bus. Do you see what I'm talking about? God knows what we need. He knows when we need it. He knew that that junkyard was there and could give us the seats and would do it. It's all worked out. Amazing providences of how God can and does work. <clears throat> what about Paul? What about Paul? Paul had a testimony. Here's his testimony. Thrice I was beaten with rods, 
Once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck at night and a day. I've been in the deep. In journeys often in perils of water, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, in perils of by the heathen, in perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brothers. He had a he had a reason to worry, I would say. Maybe a lot more reason than any of us have or have ever had. It goes on in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, hunger, thirst, fastings, often cold and nakedness. Do you know what Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? That same Paul, he wrote this, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. It's the same Paul who said, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. When Christ brought pardon of sin and peace with God, the early Christian lost their sense of urgency about earthly things. Let me repeat that. The early Christians lost their sense of urgency about earthly things. In the book of Acts we read, For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as they had need. Acts chapter 4. No problem. Needs are going to be met. Go we'll take care of There's another very good reason why we should not worry. It's harmful. It's harmful. Not only useless, not only needless, it's harmful. Turn with me to Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Here's these words. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. You see, there's a sense in which we are forfeiting God's blessing by putting yourself under God's disfavor. That worry doesn't honor God. There's another reason. It keeps you from being a true servant of God. No one can serve two masters For either he will hate the one and love the other, or 
You will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the more worried we are about other things, the less careful we are about serving God. It's sapping our time. It's sapping our energies. It's sapping our attention. It could very well be focused upon God and serving Him. And we're being pulled away from that. In the servitude of useless worry. And we've certainly commented on the incident with our Lord when he said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that. You see, Martha was literally pulled away because she was worried that there was not going to be enough of this, or this was not in place, or whatever. Worry, worry, worry. But, you see, Mary wasn't pulled away with that. I'm sure she would like for everything to be fine as well. But something drew her to the Savior to give him undivided attention. Very similar to this, of course, would be the negative effect that it has on us spiritually. It takes away our joy, our peace. Here's another reason. It's not only harmful, it's to be unsubmissive to God. It is to have a heart that is not subdued to the sovereign will and purpose of God. An unsubmissive heart is a heart that is filled with sinful pride, arrogant self-confidence, and a heart that delights in its own carnal wisdom rather than the infinite wisdom of God. A submissive heart is willing to have God in control of and directing all the affairs of our life and to rest in his infinite goodness. Perhaps I can word it this way. This excessive worry is a great affront to God. And the reason it's a great affront to God is because it is a lack of trust in Him. And lack of trust in God is a sin. I believe that we've given convincing proof that the people of God are not to be overly anxious or worry. What's the remedy? Well, very basic and foundational to remedy the situation is, first of all, make sure that you have a saving relationship with God. That's essential. P. 
Peter writing says, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about your calling and God's choosing you. And so that's an issue that needs to be dealt with. But also, meditate upon the all-sufficiency of God. And the more you study the all-sufficiency of God, the more you will see that He alone, He alone can meet your need. James, so practical. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is not from Walmart. It's from above. From above. Get that down in your heart. It's from above. What's from above? Every perfect gift. Coming down from the Father of lights. You see, we need to believe that He can give us all these good things easily. He has but to speak the word, and it's done. Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? Is there? Paul writing to the Ephesians. And how many times have we seen this happen? Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Not only can God do it easily, not only can God do it plentifully, He can do it seasonably, right on schedule, right perfect timing. He can do us good when it will do us the most good. We need to learn this. His time is always the best time. Now here's another dimension. We must also consider God can keep us from those things that would harm us. So it's not only the time and giving that's involved, it's also keeping us from having things that are not good for us, that are not timely for us, that we're not prepared for. Or there's some other reason that God knows in all of his infinite wisdom. He can keep us. He can keep us from loss. He can keep us from trouble. He can keep us from suffering. He can keep us from affliction. God doesn't always keep us from affliction, but he can and does more than we are aware of. God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love him, to those who are being called according to his purpose. He's the one that 
can cause it to be for our good according to his eternal plan and purpose. Well, not only should we make sure of our relationship to God and know that he is able and willing to help us, we should also become more and more submissive to the will of God for our life. You mentioned in our prayer service, and if it's on our prayer sheet that I mailed out, emailed the prisoner by the name of Sebastian, who was transferred out of prison facility to a county jail for a new hearing, perhaps a resentencing. And according to his understanding, the hearing was supposed to take care of Friday. But it didn't. Come to find out, the district attorney was not prepared. Uh, everybody's busy doing something else. So they told him, we're going to reschedule it February 17th. Well, the county jail environment is far different from the prison. It's, everybody's jammed up together. There's no privacy. Uh, there's loud shouting and uh, on and on and on. And I'll have to hand it to this young man. I could tell he was bothered, but he said, well, the Lord has me here for a reason. And he's witnessing to his cellmate, who seems to be open to the Lord. The wisdom, the sovereign purpose of God. And here's a young man who could be very bitter, very rebellious, and angry. But he's submissive to the will of God, serving God. And that's what we need to have and do in our life. Seek to know the will of God in his dealings with us. Just one final point. And it is this. Let the reality of eternity grip your heart. The reality of eternity grip your heart. Paul writing to the Corinthians for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal. Manage to have and maintain a loose grip on material things. They're just temporary. Keep eternity in mind. And that'll help. Well, I trust that we can deal with our tendency, and we all have it, to worry, worry, worry. Don't worry. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And you see, that takes us beyond what's happening at the moment. It tells us, God is at work in your life using even this issue that's got you so bothered. He's in control. And he's going to use it to help you be the person that he wants you to be. He has a reason. Well, let's pray. Our gracious God, we confess that we all have this uh, tendency to, to worry and be overly
concerned about things. Pray, Father, that you'll help us to have faith and confidence in you, our Creator, and you, our Redeemer, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And to uh, obey the command that we have, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.